Okay. Uh, so thanks very much for having me. Um, the title is Death and the Brain, Time to Re-examine the Legal Definition of Death. Uh, so again, thanks to the University of Ottawa, thanks uh, to the center for having me. Uh, the plan is that I'm just gonna do this presentation in about 30 minutes, which leaves the other 30 minutes for interactive Q&A, which Jennifer will uh, moderate. A couple disclosures. Uh, I am a, a, a consultant, an official observer on the Uniform Law Commission's study committee on the Uniform Determination of Death Act. I'll talk more about that. Uh, also a consultant on, on the uh, Definition and Determination of Death Project, which is a project of these three Canadian associations, and um, also on the International Donation and Transplantation Legislative and Policy Forum. Uh, none of those three relationships are financial, but just using the JAMA uh, form, they, they may constitute relationships or activities that readers could perceive uh, to have influenced me, so I disclose them. Uh, and, and just one other short note is exactly a month from today, if you're interested in brain death, there's a terrific two-day conference at the University of Chicago with a lot of uh, legal, medical, and ethics experts. All right. So in Canada, there are only two provinces where there are legislated laws uh, defining how death, uh, brain death should be determined. In contrast, all 56 US jurisdictions have laws specifying how brain death should be determined. But uh, there is significant variability uh, in exactly how that's done. So first, there is variability from state to state to state. Um, so the laws aren't exactly identical. So they, they may vary in, in how many physicians you need, what are the qualifications of those physicians, how exactly are the tests administered. So there's variability from state to state. There's also variability within a given state, from hospital to hospital to hospital within a state. So they may not determine death on neurological criteria or brain death in exactly the same way. In fact, not only may they not, they, they don't. Um, and then third, even within one single hospital, there is variability from physician to physician to physician in exactly how brain death is determined within that one hospital. On top of all of that, there's variability or a gap between what the law says is the way to determine brain death and the way in which brain death is actually determined by clinicians at the bedside. Now, often in healthcare and elsewhere, we not only tolerate variability, but we, we encourage it, right? Um, just one example, it, our former US Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said, hey, it's great that we have different states and those states can serve as laboratories, right? That can try novel social experiments, right? So take, for example, the context in which she wrote that, which is medical aid and dying, right? So in the United States, we have 10 jurisdictions where made is legal um, and it's not legal in the other states. And now what we're seeing in 2021, especially, is the states are innovating, right? The, the, the eligibility conditions and the safeguards in these states are no longer uniform because the states are trying different things. And those serve as models for yet additional states. But that's medical aid and dying. Death, death is different, right? Death is more consequential. And therefore, it's not clear that variability is good. Um, so just take them from a, from a few different perspectives. Take a medical perspective, for example. We need to know when a patient is dead so we know whether or not they should continue to get treatment such as mechanical ventilation. We need to know when a patient is dead so we know whether or not we may transplant organs so we can comply with the dead donor rule. From a legal perspective, it's really important, right, that we know whether somebody is dead or not. It makes a lot of difference from a lot of different angles, right? 
in, from the criminal context, is it murder or is it just aggravated assault? From a tort perspective, is it wrongful death or is it medical malpractice? You know, if you look at from an insurance perspective, whether they're dead or not, depend, that impacts whether health insurance will continue to pay and whether life insurance will, will, will pay now, right? Property, we need to know when inheritance will happen, state taxes. From a family perspective, you need to know if you're single or married. You need to know uh, there's all sorts of family law uh, consequences. And then even from a, a family personal perspective, um, people need to know when to grieve, when to bury the body, right? And so it's, it, death, death is a little bit more consequential. It has consequences way outside the medical context. It's therefore generally thought that uniformity, clarity, and certainty are especially premium when it comes to the termination of death. And just to give a quick illustration of this point, I'll just use a quick story, a quick scene from this 100 year old movie, The Wizard of Oz, right? You may recall that um, Dorothy's house gets caught up in the tornado and lands on the Wicked Witch of the East. Okay, well, she was a Wicked Witch, so that's good. It's good that maybe the house landed on her. And so the munchkins all celebrate and they say, ding dong, the witch is dead, the witch is dead. The witch. Okay, great. But then the munchkin mayor says, hey, hold on guys, this is a pretty big deal, right? Death determination. Um, so the mayor comes out and says, hold on, we've got to verify it legally to see if she is morally, ethically, spiritually, physically, positively, absolutely, undeniably and reliably dead. So following the mayor's uh, advice, the, the, the munchkin coroner comes out and then he examines the Wicked Witch of the East and then pronounces, she's not only merely dead, she's really most sincerely dead. And this, this is the kind of bright line clarity that we need between life and death. And unfortunately, we don't have it as much as we should. Brain death is under attack. Um, we've heard stories in the past few days about how different Yemeni cities are under attack. Well, brain death is also under attack. So this is a Texas Right to Life is a pro-life advocacy organization. And on their consumer help website, they say, Doctors declared your loved one brain dead and want to withdraw life-sustaining treatment against your will. We can help. And, and, and in fact, there have been a lot of conflicts that have gone to the courts in just the past three, three years, including all of these patients and many others as well. In courtrooms from coast to coast and many in between just in the past uh, three or four years. Now, I recognize there's been a fair number of cases going to Canadian courts as well, especially in Ontario. And on top of the court cases, right, this is a recent uh, 2021 Canadian Journal of Anesthesiology article, there are lots of conflicts, uh, family clinician conflicts that don't go to court uh, as well. Now, this these issues about uh, conflicts regarding brain death, both conceptual and ethical conflicts, have been debated in the bioethics and medical literature for a long time, um, probably in every single major bioethics journal in the world. Uh, there have been whole book-length treatments like this one by Bob Trug, or this one by Bob Veach, or this one by Art Kaplan. Um, but generally, those, all that debate, all that, all those, all those journal articles, all those books haven't really rocked the boat too much, right? The, we just keep going down the stream um, just as always. But there have been so many court cases now um, and, 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 and other sorts of debates that it, the weight, the, the scale is starting to tip. Uh, one of our top neurologist ethicists, Jim Burnett, a few years ago, observed that the critics and skeptics, the critics and skeptics of brain death, have not gained much traction with lawmakers. And that was probably true several years ago when he said that, but it's probably not true anymore. 
Um, this is no longer just an academic debate for, for the philosophers and, and the journal articles. Um, these issues are in our courthouses, in our appellate courthouses, and in our legislatures. So here's the, here's the roadmap, okay, for the talk. And it's going to be in four parts. First, I want to give you a quick legal primer on brain death. Second, I want to describe four different legal attacks on brain death talk about the response to those attacks, which is the revised Uniform Determination of Death Act, and then just to give you some reasons for why there should be adoption of, the, of this RUDDA. Okay, so we start with the Uniform Determination of Death Act, the UDDA. This is basically the law on brain death in all 56 US jurisdictions. And it says basically that there are two ways to determine death by, the, by determining the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions, the traditional definition, or by the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain. Now, it, it's that second prong, the newer prong that, that we're going to focus on. And basically, it says that brain death is death, or to use the terminology from the President's Commission on Bioethics, total brain failure is death. And once a patient has been determined dead, clinicians may then withdraw organ-sustaining treatment. Uh, that's built in. That, that built into all the guidelines. Basically, they say once somebody's determined dead medical support should be discontinued, or all medical interventions should be withdrawn. All of these rules have been legally settled since the early 1980s. So we've had now 40 years of, of a consensus, a relatively stable consensus on, on the points that I just mentioned. But over just the past three to five years, that consensus has become increasingly unraveled. So here is attack number one. Many families want a religious exemption from brain death. They have that already right now in New Jersey. So the law in New Jersey says death shall not be declared on neurological criteria if that would violate the patient's personal religious beliefs. So if the patient has a known religious objection, obviously they're not making it themselves, but if, you, if there's some evidence that they had a religious objection, then you may not declare death on brain death criteria. Now, the patient may satisfy brain death criteria and you can measure that they satisfy brain death criteria in New Jersey, but if they have a known religious objection, you may not declare death. So officially they're still alive. You can't declare death until, they, until this patient with a religious objection satisfies cardiopulmonary criteria for death. Now, when the law was passed in the early 1990s, cardiopulmonary death would follow brain death very quickly in just a matter of days. But today, 30 years later, because of advances in um, ICU care, in critical care, now cardiopulmonary death often doesn't follow brain death for months. And in some cases, like with Jahai McMath, for years. Now this, this exemption, this idea of an exemption from brain death has been rejected everywhere outside New Jersey but it's still asked for quite a lot. So at the end of last year, uh, there was a number of cases, one of which involved this patient in Texas, which was litigated through the Texas courts and the Texas appellate courts seeking a religious exemption. Uh, a court, another case went up to the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Um, basically the family was suing the state of California um, over the care of this patient and in the lawsuit against the state of California, the parents were saying, 
we're Christians with firm religious beliefs that so long as the heart is beating, the patient is still alive. Even if the reason the heart is beating is because of uh, life support. Therefore, to remove cardiopulmonary support, which is what happened in that case, that would be an unconstitutional interference with our freedom of religion. Now, uh, there have been other cases. Uh, uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia had two cases at the same time in the summer of 2018 involving this patient and this patient. There was an Orthodox Jewish family in Washington, D.C. that wanted a religious exemption, um, a Muslim family in Michigan, and a Buddhist family in Massachusetts all wanted religious exemptions. None of them got religious exemptions, but the point is there, there's a lot of push for this. Uh, there have even been more recent cases um, in New York and in Michigan. Um, and of course, there are very similar cases in Ontario. Um, both this issue was basically pushed by in the McKitty case and in the Unamuno case. And we're going to see more of these cases. Um, and a key reason is because there are pro-life advocacy organizations that have both the money and the interest in pushing this point. That's attack number one, religious exemption from brain death. Attack number two, must clinicians get consent for brain death testing? So some families try to prevent the clinicians from doing the, performing the brain death diagnosis, doing the tests. Uh, that was, for, uh, was tried, for example, in this Texas case from late last year. Why this? Why do they do this? Why this strategy? Well, if you, what are clinician duties after brain death, right? Once the diagnosis is made and the patient is declared dead, they, clinicians have very limited duties to the family. Uh, you might even say that basically families don't have any post brain death treatment rights. So therefore, recognizing that, um, they focus on their pre brain death treatment rights. And they have some of those. So that's where they focus. And largely this debate centers on the apnea test. And the apnea test is the final confirmatory test for diagnosing, determining brain death. It's built into both the adult guidelines from the American Academy of Neurology and in the pediatric guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So what's happening is we have more family refusal saying you can't do the apnea test. Most of the cases that have gone to court have been pediatric cases, so we might call them parental refusals. Basically, the, the parent is saying, no, you can't, don't do the apnea test. Um, if the clinicians can't do the apnea test, then they can't determine that the patient is brain dead. And if they can't determine that the patient's brain dead, well, then their treatment duties are going to continue until the patient satisfies cardiopulmonary death, which may be months or years later. Effectively, this is actually an opt-out of brain death. It's, it, it's practically really, from in terms of a practical consequence, the same thing as the New Jersey religious exemption. So in New Jersey, when you have a patient with, with a known religious objection, you may determine brain death, but you can't declare it because the law says that. Well, here, if, if, you're, if you're not allowed to even do the tests and you can't even determine that the patient is brain dead, then you definitely can't declare the patient's brain dead if you can't even determine whether or not they are. So that leaves the question though, must clinicians honor the refusal? Or to say it another way, do clinicians need consent to do the apnea test? Well, the jurisdictions are just split on this point, on, on the answer to that question. Uh, so some, some places say yes. So there was a case out of Billings, Montana, involving this little six-year-old boy, Alan Calloway, who drowned, or according to his parents, almost drowned. And he goes to this hospital and the clinicians do the um, bedside tests, right? Uh, the clinical exam, and they think, yeah, he's probably brain dead. They want to do the apnea test to confirm. But the mom says, no, can't do the apnea test. 
So the hospital goes to court uh, and says, judge, we have a patient in our hospital. We need to know, is that patient alive or is that patient dead? It's kind of a fundamental question, judge. Court says, no. Your request permitting testing is denied. The mother has sole authority to make medical decisions, including brain functionality exams. So do clinicians need consent for the apnea test? Montana said yes. Kansas also said yes. Very similar. Another young boy also drowned and parents uh, forbid the brain exam testing and the court issued an injunction uh, upholding that. California, same thing. Also another young boy, also drowned, goes to the hospital. Parents refuse the clinician's permission to do the apnea test. Court issues uh, another injunction prohibiting the hospital from doing the apnea test without the parent's consent. And yet another hospital in California, same thing, involving this patient. So do clinicians need consent for the apnea test? Montana, Kansas, and California all said, yes, you do need the consent. And that is a plausible position uh, for the courts to take because normally clinicians may not do things to a patient without consent from the patient or from their legally authorized decision maker, right? Otherwise, it's a battery. It's a medical battery. But other states said, no, uh, you don't need consent to do the brain death test. So Virginia said you don't need consent. Nevada, New York, Georgia, and Texas all said you don't, you don't need consent to do the test. So we have some states that say yes, some states say no, and who knows what the answer is in the rest of the states. So the conflict continues. There's this children's hospital with this patient, this children's hospital with this patient. So that's attack number two. Do you need consent to do the brain death testing? And, and, and I should have said, the, the attacks, I think, get more serious as we go along, so I'm building up. Attack number three, what are the accepted medical criteria for determining death? Well, again, the law in basically all U.S. jurisdictions is the Uniform Determination of Death Act. What does it say? It says that when you make a determination of death, that must be made in accordance with accepted medical standards, accepted medical standards. The problem is there is enormous variability, as, as I mentioned when I started, in, in the medical standards that are deployed uh, from hospital to hospital across the country. And this has been measured and published on repeatedly in, in basically the top journals by the top neurologists um, and just look at the titles, Variability of Brain Death Policies in the United States, Improving Uniformity in Brain Death Determination, Variability of Brain Death Determination Guidelines in Leading U.S. Neurological Institutions, Variability in Reported Physician Practices for Brain Death Determination, right? So this has been measured and documented again and again over, over a period of years. And this kind of really all got to a a real, this manifested itself in a real practical way in a case out of, out of Reno, Nevada, and uh, involving this patient. And she went in uh, for an exploratory laparotomy, and during that suffered a catastrophic anoxic brain injury. A few days afterward, clinicians determined that she met the American Academy of Neurology criteria for brain death. So she's dead. Her dad did not buy that. He says, no, she's not dead. He goes, he takes this to court in Reno. Uh, he loses. And why does he lose? Because the evidence in the case from the treating physicians was that she met the American Academy of Neurology criteria for death. So the judge, well, if she meets the AAN criteria, then she's dead. So dad appeals that up to the Supreme Court of Nevada, where he wins. And why does he win? What does the Supreme Court of Nevada say? It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant that she meets the AAN criteria because they're not the right criteria. 
looking at this evidence of, of, of variability in the actual standards that are used um, in hospitals across the country, the court said, it's not clear that those are accepted medical standards. And that's what the UDDA requires. The UDDA requires that the determination be made using accepted medical standards. You, all you did was determine that she met the AN criteria, but what you didn't show me, you didn't show the judge was that the AN criteria are accepted medical standards. So that's attack number three, which medical standards are authoritative um, under the law. And then finally, attack number four. Now, notwithstanding that Supreme Court of Nevada case, generally people in the neurology community think that the AN standards are the most authoritative criteria, um, at, least, at least for adults. There's a separate set of criteria for, for children. Um, the problem here is even if, even if you get past that problem of whether the AN criteria are accepted medical standards, there's a completely separate problem. And that's that the AN criteria don't measure what the UDDA requires. So just to remind you, the UDDA requires that the determination of death, what you're determining is the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain. That's, that's the language. But brain dead people still do stuff. So we know that dead pregnant women can still gestate a fetus, right? We hear about cases like this almost you know, every other month or so. We also know from the research from Alan Schumann that people determined dead can still heal wounds, fight infections, mount a stress response, grow, sexually mature, and regulate their temperature. It appears that the AN criteria measure the cessation of only some functions of part of the brain, but the law, the UDDA requires what, that you be determining the cessation of all functions of the entire brain. There, appear to, there appears to be a gap between the medical criteria on the one hand and the legal standard on the other hand. And to put a finer point on, on this, uh, in 2019, the American Academy of Neurology put out this position statement. And in this position statement, they said that the patient can satisfy our brain death guidelines, which, which means they're dead. Um, yet, yet, neuroendocrine function may be present. In other words, what they're saying, it's, it's okay to declare somebody dead despite ongoing functions of the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. And they say, well, this is not inconsistent with the whole brain standard of death. So that's, that's the gist of the position statement. It's not inconsistent with the whole brain standard of death, except that it is. Uh, the UDDA requires that there be irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain. And the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are part of the brain and they have ongoing functions. So it appears that people are, are being, they're medically dead, but technically they're not legally dead. And some of these cases that have been going to court last couple of years are pushing this point and, and they have some ground to push it. In other, and I say it another way, the medical criteria that we're using don't require the cessation of all functions. They require the cessation of critical functions, okay? And maybe that's a legitimate position to take from a medical or ethical perspective, but um, that's not what the law says. Um, the, the medical profession has sort of moved the goalposts a little bit from the place that the, that the UDDA set them. Or to say it a different way, using this analogy, a few years ago in the state of Montana, they, they, they got rid of having a numerical speed limit, right? So they said, hey, just in the, at least in the daytime, during daylight hours, um, drive as fast as you want, as long as it's reasonable and prudent, right? And, th and that meant that police officers in the state of Montana 
had a lot of discretion to figure out are you driving too fast or not? But they, they, they didn't have any number to use. They just used their judgment about whether how fast you were driving was too fast. This is not what the UDDA did. The UDDA did not delegate that kind of discretion to physicians to figure out brain death is whatever you think it should be, right? That's not what the law says. Um, the, the, the better analogy to what the UDDA did would be the UDDA would be a, a, a specific numerical speed limit, like 70 miles per hour, right? And then the job that's delegated to the police is to use your radar gun to figure out whether this car is going under or over 70 miles per hour, right? It's just to measure the satisfaction of the standard. We didn't delegate, uh, and, and same thing with, with brain death, we delegated to, to the the law delegated to the physicians the measurement of the satisfaction of the standard. They didn't delegate the invention or specification of the standard itself. Okay, so that's tack number four, this mis mismatch between medical and legal standards. Okay, so to recap, right, we have these four tacks. They sort of exacerbate issues of variability and uncertainty regarding brain death determination. Um, and it is worth uh, remembering the origins of the UDDA, right? Which, which was came out in 1981. And this is the, the report that basically provides the background or the rationale for the UDDA. And it's very, very clear that the primary purpose of the UDDA was to react against what was happening in the 1970s. Throughout the decade of the 1970s, lots of states across the country were enacting brain death statutes but each state was enacting a very different brain death statute. So we had six, seven, or eight different flavors or varieties of brain death statutes from state to state to state. And, and that was thought to be intolerable, right? Brain death needs to be determined the same way um, in every state. So the, the point of the UDDA was to impose uniformity on this massive variability that cropped up during the 1970s. But because of some recent, because of recent developments over the past three to five years, it's kind of like we're, it's 1979 again, because it's, there's this, again, we have problems of variability. Okay, so what's happening, right? Here, what's the response? Well, the Uniform Law Commission, which is the organization that writes uniform laws like the UDDA, has formed a, a study committee to, uh, to think, should we have a revised Uniform Determination of Death Act, an RUDDA? And they already uh, took step one, which is they formed a study committee. We, and I'm on it, we've been meeting, we, we have a meeting tomorrow actually. And the point of the study committee is to answer the question, should we? Should we amend the UDDA? It's, it's a weather question, it's like a yes or no question. Should we or should we not amend the UDDA? They'll make a recommendation that will go to the executive committee at ULC. And then the, if, they, if the recommendation is to amend the UDDA and the executive committee agrees, they'll form a drafting committee, and then the drafting committee will um, uh, dra actually draft the RUDDA. Um, and they may address some of the things that I talked about, uh, the, the, the attacks that I talked about, maybe some other issues, and maybe they'll, if they finish their work in a year, that will go up to the executive committee in July, 2022. If that gets approved, then the next step is each of the several state legislatures will decide whether or not they want to adopt the RUDDA. If this happens, it should reduce variability and increase certainty and trust. Um, it's worth noting that some states like Nevada have already amended their UDDA on their own to, to, to address some of these problems. Um, and there's legislation in Oklahoma that they're considering this week um, along the same lines. So why? why? Why should there be an RUDDA? Why should a state legislature adopt an RUDDA? Well, like I said, there is variability in the medical standards, right? We need to know how is brain death determined and it should be uniformly determined from hospital to hospital within a given state and from state to state. There's a mismatch between the legal criteria and the medical standards and that gap should be closed. There's more conflict in litigation and all of this is, I think, potentially going to impact public trust in the determination of death on neurological criteria. Variability 
uncertainty makes the whole determination on brain death look subjective and arbitrary instead of looking objective and authoritative. And the real practical consequence, it's not the only one, but one of the major consequences is, um, is the organ donation rate, right? 75% of our organs come from donors determined dead on brain death criteria. Um, and we actually really want that number to go up, but there's actually some danger. It could go down, right? If people don't trust uh, the diagnosis. Plus, it would be good to resolve these questions about do you need consent to do the testing? Should we offer religious exemptions or at least a religious accommodation? So I hope that maybe this quick snapshot of some of what's going on with brain death policy and law in the United States might shed some light on what Canada might do. Uh, the line between life and death needs to be bright and clear and sharp. And unfortunately, it's getting kind of fuzzy and kind of gray. And I think the law is at least one way to help restore some clarity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was um, extremely interesting. Um, I see that there's questions starting to uh, come in. For all of you who are here who might like to pose a question, if you pose them in the Q&A, um, what I will do is read them out to, uh, to the group so they know what the question is and, and then uh, pass them over to Thaddeus to answer them. So please do uh, put your questions in the Q&A. So the first question that has come in, uh, Thaddeus, is uh, from Michael Wolfson, who's asking, are there any other jurisdictions outside the U.S. that have what you would consider a sensible way of defining death? So two things. One is, right, there's a very recent, um, gigantic, actually, uh, set of publications in JAMA called the World Brain Death Project. And what they, they looked at, really, the laws of brain death across most jurisdictions on the face of the earth. And most of them do recognize brain death as a way, as a way to determine death, but they also noted that there's variability from country to country. So I was talking about variability within the United States, but there's also variability from country, uh, country to country. Um, I don't know that I don't know that I could point to, to you, you know, a specific country and say they 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 got it right, they figured it out, and we should all do what they're doing. Some people make this. Some people really like the UK model. It's probably too complicated to get into, but I just like for people who are very concerned about something that I didn't talk about at all, which is does brain death correlate to biological death, right? That's another debate that's going on and arguably it, it doesn't. Um, but for the people that are really focused on that debate, they think that the, that the UK, the, the British model uh, satisfies that concern, but I'm not sure that I don't know that I can give you a country to say that that's that's the model we should all follow. Maybe maybe if you could say a little bit more about the brainstem standard in the UK, because the second question from uh, Adam Emilianchuk says, do you think the US might move towards something like the brainstem standard in the UK? So, yeah, and I, I may have just for the sake of using gigantic <laughs> fonts on my slide, not put the so the, the full UDDA says um, you must determine uh, the, the complete and irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem. So the U.S. requires that there that uh, it be both the brainstem and um, higher and, and, and higher brain functions all have to have ceased. So some people break that apart. So there's th well, this argument probably is, isn't going anywhere from a, from a policy or legal perspective. But there's a fair amount of currency to the argument that we should just focus on higher brain death because that's what we care about, um, is that can you um, be, a, be a person, right? We don't so much care, if, are you a living organism? We care about, are you a person? So can you communicate? Can you interact with the world? So if you're permanently unconscious, even if your brainstem still functions, some people say we, we should call them dead, right? So anencephalic babies would be dead. They have a working brainstem, but they don't have an upper brain or even people in a P, what we call, what we used to call PVS, they would be dead. That's probably too far to go because since their brainstem still functions, they may still be breathing. And, and so to put somebody uh, who's breathing 
uh, to bury them seems there's an emotional intuitive problem there. So that we may not cross that, but the UK goes the other way. So they, they require only uh, the cessation of brainstem function, but not uh, higher function. That's relatively rare, I think, in, in the world. But, that's, but I think that's one of the things that all those JAMA supplements uh, provide some nice charts to see who's doing what. Thanks. Um, Sam Shemi's uh, asking, uh, there's a stark socio-political polarization in the US. Can you comment on why legal challenges are generally not a problem in other Western countries or as much of a problem as they appear to be in the US? Well, I, it's a good question. Although I, I, I don't know that if I 100% agree with the premise because you, you, Sam knows and you know, Jennifer, there have been a fair number of Canadian cases. There have actually been a fair number of, of British cases as well. The one thing that is interesting is I could not find any Australian cases. Um, but so I don't know that the US is completely unique in having people challenge various aspects of, of brain death. There have been a lot more cases, even pro rata. I mean, it's obviously a bigger country. Um, and I think I, I do think part of that is 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 because it's organized. It, what I mean by that is um, it, it, it's the, it's sort of the same players that are interested in pushing back on abortion uh, in the United States. And I think it's maybe a symmetrical position for them, which is we're going to protect all life, no matter what its state or status at this end of the spectrum. Well, we're also going to protect all life no matter what its state or status at the other end of the, of the life spectrum as well. Um, and so I don't think, I don't know that, that families either have the money or the resources or even the, the inclination to really push this, but they get teamed up with uh, organizations that say, hey, we'll, we'll find the expert witnesses for you. We'll find the local attorney for you um, and so forth. And, uh, and I, I think that maybe the other countries don't have that, that kind of, um, pro-life uh, organization infrastructure. Um, Eric Wasilenko has asked, thanks for this, well, first, thanks for this excellent talk. Um, if our UDDA goes forward in some form, what would you predict the subsequent attacks might be? That might depend on what form our UDDA takes, perhaps. Yeah, so that's that, well, that, mm -hmm. yeah, so Jennifer, you caught, I mean, obviously, we have no idea what the mm -hmm. RUDDA will say. Um, but uh, I, I should say a couple things. So I'm not talking about uh, the, you know, the uh, I'm not revealing secret mm -hmm. debates that are happening. But um, it is worth noting that at least at the study committee stage, which is where we are right now, it's very broad. I think there's 80 people, right? And so they included people who are absolute opponents um, to very to many many aspects of brain death, um, and and so I think they're making a really good effort to involve all the stakeholders from the from this very early stage, right? We haven't even decided, it's only the study committee. The study committee is only figure out, are we going to revise the UDDA? We're not even actually doing it yet, but even at this stage, it's super inclusive. Um, and I think that should mitigate the fact that certain stakeholders would sort of get caught by surprise that this thing sort of just gets published one day and they're like, what, mm -hmm. what is that? So I, I think that th that should mitigate the concerns that, that were just flagged. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, it, sure, there, there probably still will be challenges no matter what, because uh, you're not gonna, right? We're balancing different things, right? I mean, on mm -hmm. one hand, if you make determining brain death too difficult, then you're going to make organ procurement too difficult. Um, and so we're we are balancing different things and where you strike that balance is, is probably not, is going to leave some people unhappy. Yeah. Um, John Williams asked the question, if, if um, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, I'm putting words uh, that he didn't write, but if you, if, if you're correct that what we really care about some some amorphous we is personhood when personhood is lost how how then do we define that well i guess i should clarify i was just saying that is a mm -hmm. position that's out there mm -hmm. i don't know that i um i've, I've not defended that mm -hmm. uh, myself i i think it's i don't i i i it's an attractive position in a 
philosophical my, uh, thought experiment type of setting in a classroom at the University of Ottawa. But but I, I don't know I don't know that 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 the personhood I, that that's going to become the a legal standard. Maybe maybe I missed the question. No no I think I think that okay. answers. Thank you. Um, Ivor Berkowitz asks, how can you argue that hypothalamic and pituitary function is not significant in meeting the loss of the entire function of the brain? And that persistent function can just be dismissed. I think maybe he's asking how the AAN can argue that. Well, so, so I think it's worth distinguishing two things. Mm -hmm. One, one is um, I don't know that that's a ridiculous position, right? I, I guess mm -hmm. maybe those functions aren't uh, significant, and in the sort of things that Alan Schumann identifies. You know that that take, take, take Jahai McMath for example that she enters puberty that she you know that that she has these various functions. I don't know that it's a ridiculous position to say, well, yeah, the body is doing things biologically, but those are insignificant. We don't care about those; they're not meaningful. That's a legitimate position. I, I, I could buy that. So I guess what I was focusing on though is, okay, fine, AAN. You know that's that's a fair position. Um, the problem is it's it's just inconsistent with the law, um, and that's and so that that was I guess the problem that I was flagging. What we could move to to what Dr. Berkowitz is saying, which which is there's a if we get past that and we somehow reconcile the law with the AN uh, guidelines, we then would still have the second level question, which is well, are those good guidelines? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I I didn't even get to the second stage because I'm still stuck on the first stage, which is we either have to change the guidelines or we have to change the law. But it's 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 not good that they're inconsistent because this is what a lot of lawsuits are pushing, and this is why they get passed. I mean, if you think of the stages of litigation, they get like Jahai McMath. She got past a motion to dismiss. She got past summary judgment because and, and, and that went up to the appellate courts. It went up to the Supreme Court of California, and all those judges said. Yeah, it looks like you have an argument here, right? So the case did not get dismissed in multiple gateways of, of litigation because of, of this of this gap between the medical and legal criteria. That was an issue in that case, um, and and so that's that's what I, that's what I was focused on. But I but I I agree um, that might get a little bit more clinical as to zeroing down on exactly what a human body can do after brain death and how much we care about those, those functions. Mm -hmm. um, Valerie Cooper asks, do you see patterns between the states that have a legalized form of medical assistance in dying and those that have lower levels of court cases uh, regarding brain death? So is there a correlation there? Uh, I'm gonna have to say no. I, I, I don't think there's any correlation whatsoever because there have been a lot of brain death cases in California. California legalized medical aid and dying five years ago. Um, so I, I, I mean, maybe if you really run, if I haven't plugged the numbers in and you know charted the stuff in, in, in two grids, but uh, uh, I mean, it, it's also hard because most states don't have medical aid and dying. So it's, I don't, I don't. That's that's a that's an interesting. It's interesting, interesting question. I just uh, I don't know the answer. And I don't know if I have the right math skill, this you know, statistical, mm -hmm. you know, validity skills to even do it. Hmm. Um, Sam sends in another question. He says, uh, "You you speak of a medical legal divide and claim doctors are trying to move the goalposts, but without acknowledging the U.S. law did not construct the goalposts without defining whole brain, all functions, and irreversible." Uh, so he's talking. He he gives us an example: cardiorespiratory standards. Of death are no longer irreversible. Hmm. Well, so so let me, yeah, that's a good why well, that raises something else, right? Mm -hmm. But I guess what I'm saying is the law says all functions of the entire brain. It's at, those are very categorical words. They're absolute words, all. Um, and but day to day, in in the eleven thousand brain death cases we're going to diagnose this year we're not measuring the cessation of all functions, we're measuring the cessation of a subset of functions that are built in the AAN criteria. And they're excluding endocrine function. That's why I say move the goalposts, right? Because the, the UDDA set the goalposts here, but the AAN's goalposts are over here. 
but Sam's absolutely right. And that's actually, I didn't want to muddle the talk too much, but there's a whole separate reason for an RUDDA, which has nothing to do with brain death, but it has to do with the cardiopulmonary death. Um, and, and, and that is um, that what's been growing in terms of organ procurement, growing a lot. Now it's 25% of all uh, cadaver organs it used to be like 5%. Now it's 25%. Um, so we, 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 we declare people dead after the cessation of, cardio, of cardiac circulatory function. The, the UDDA says irreversible cessation. Um, it's obviously not irreversible because we, we, the whole point is we're literally transplanting an organ, the heart, which is, uh, which the function will be, uh, will be reversed or the cessation of the function will be reversed in the, in the recipient. Um, so it prob that's another, I think, uh, gap and it probably would be good apart from everything else I said to revise the UDDA to instead of saying irreversible cessation is to say permanent cessation because and that's just to be accurate and it's just to make sure that what we're actually doing uh fits with what the law says i mean it, a little bit of deviation i guess is tolerable but i guess the problem is we're building up and if we're going to amend the uddda anyway then i think we might we should address that uh that circulatory donation problem as well would uh, the switch to the word permanent answer the problem, though, of restarting the heart uh, in a new recipient? So the main person who's articulated this is, uh, I mean, there's a bit others, but is Jim Burnett. And the idea is permanent, meaning we will not, uh, for this person, it's permanent because we're not going to restart the heart. And the reason we're not going to restart the heart is because the patient didn't want us to. They have an advanced directive and they have a DNR order and their surrogate agrees. Uh, so we're not going to. Now, but, but the, the, it's, so I think the, it's fair to say it is a permanent cessation for, for them, but it's not irreversible. May, I mean, maybe that's too subtle, but, but this, this has annoyed a fair number of people. And, and again, what I said, I don't know this would be enough to warrant a revision of the law that permanent versus irreversible. But if we're gonna revise it for all the reasons that I said, I think we might as well take the opportunity to, to make, to address that as well. Thank you. Um, Justin Smith asks, do you have an opinion about the President's Council's reformulation of the philosophical basis of brain death as the loss of a person's ability to perform his fundamental vital work, meaning consciousness and breathing? So, and I should say a couple of things for those who are interested, all the President's Council reports are freely available. You know, there may be two or 300 pages, mm -hmm. but they're all freely available, I think at the Georgetown uh, Bioethics Library website. Um, so this, the, 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 the 2008 report, uh, basically, I think, let me say two things about that. One is the fact that they even did what, what uh, Justin just said they did is itself really notable because it, it was a really big acknowledgement and concession to the fact that there's a lot of research like that of Alan Schumann and that, that they even had to reconstitute the conceptual framework of brain death showed that, um, I think acknowledged that there were con some conceptual problems. Um, I, I think, yeah, I, I well, I'm afraid, I, I don't know if we have time to get into the, uh, I, I'm generally okay with it. Um, I don't know that I would have formulated it in exactly that that way. But it's but in a sense, I guess I, I tried to keep this on the legal mm -hmm. question. That that moves back to a bigger question about what is death, like what is human, what is the death of a human being, which is a, a mm -hmm. I think a, a much more difficult question than the little simple legal questions that I'm focusing on. I should say I misspoke. It's Justin Satin, not Justin Smith. I'm sorry. Um, he was asking also, do you think that this reformulation of philosophical uh, basis of brain death can, should, or will inform the RUDDA? Maybe. Um, it, it's, it's, I guess it's worth, maybe I should say just a couple things real quick. Mm -hmm. This is just a procedural point. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of observers. So there's a lot of neurologists, a lot of philosophers, some law professors. Um, but at the end of the day, the only people that vote are the commissioners 
and generally the commissioners are judges and lawyers um, who, who, who are on the Uniform Law Commission, who are generally generalists, right? They're not in health law or healthcare law, but definitely not in the brain death. And so um, it's, it's not clear how much, you know, are they gonna read that report? Are they gonna read the commentary on that report? Um, so I'm just saying from a, and it, it's the same thing in the legislature, right? How many, how many senators in the Senate are gonna do a lot of background reading on anything? So I guess, uh, I, guess I, I would hope the answer is yes, um, but I'm just thinking procedurally, uh, I'm not sure how much, given the time constraints, uh, I'm not sure how much it will influence. I think we probably have have time for another question. Um, it's breaking my heart a little bit. There's a lot of excellent questions I'm going to miss. But um, Jen Herbst, who is our former Fulbright uh, visiting, hello, Jen, um, asks, do you have any thoughts on how the beliefs and needs of communities most likely to distrust the healthcare community might inform or get incorporated into any new standard? That's a, that, so hi, Jen. Uh, that's, that's a great, uh, a great question. I, I, I think I'll just maybe make a procedural point. Both the Canadian DDD project and the ULC project, I think, have a, have a whole separate infrastructure focused on stakeholder engagement. So I think they're both very conscious of hearing what are your, uh, what are your concerns. I know that the committee that Jen uh, chairs, the subcommittee, right, was even thinking about involve, literally inviting family members from like the Takesha McKinney case to come and talk to the committee. So um, I do think what I'm, what I'm seeing um, is, is a significant amount of, of engagement to see what are your concerns? Um, because I guess this goes back to somebody else's question, which is we don't want to find out that we go through a multi-year process, put out this model law, and then nobody, it, it gets widely attacked in the press and in the courts. So I think people are being proactive in figuring out what the what those concerns of distrust and mistrust are right now. 